the condition of the condition of health care in Iowa. The real skinny. The truth with Dr. Ed Brown. Next, live here on The View from a Pew. Let's get it started in here. Let's get it started in here. Let's get it started in here. Welcome to The View from a Pew, a conversation among Christians who are out to grow their faith by asking the simple questions, the tough questions, and the stuff you really wish your pastor would talk about. Come on now, let's reason together. It's your voice we want to hear. The phone lines are open, so join the conversation. Call 855-244-0077. That's 855-244-0077. Now, here's your host. J. Michael McCoy. Four minutes after the hour, welcome. This is webcast1live.com, locally 99.3 KTIA, coming to a radio station near you. This is The View from a Pew. I'm J. Michael McCoy. It's Wednesday, which means Tom Coates is not in Mexico, (laughs) smoking cigars, counting his gold bullion on the beach. He's back in studio, and we've got uh, Mr. Ed Brown, who is the CEO of the Iowa Clinic. I mistakenly called him Dr. And Tom reminded me quickly that if anybody got an honorary doctorate around here, it would be Tom first. (laughs) So maybe we start. Of course, Dr. Tom, everybody thinks then you're a basketball coach. Well, I remember years ago you had uh, uh, Dr. Mike Hardwick on. I thought, are you going to call him doctor? I ought to be doctor, too. That's right. I I wouldn't be called doctor. That's right. Well, but he's a real doctor. (laughs) I know. (laughs) But, you know, for uh, 199 bucks and on the Internet, we could get you a doctor. There you go. I thought I'm going (laughs) to sign me up, Mac. There you go. All right. Uh, And Ed Brown is here with the I. Clinics, Ed. Nice to have you here. It's good to be back, Mac. Ed is not only, uh, um, and I, I'm not. I, I, I want to say this right. You're an expert on healthcare. I mean, it's that's your living. You're the CEO, yeah. for heaven's sakes. Yep, I've been around it for over 30 years. All right, so so an expert on healthcare, but he's also a political junkie. So we're going to kind of combine today's conversation with a little bit of politics and a little bit of health care. And also later, we're going to talk about Tom's really well-written. Did you write that? Oh, no, your wife wrote it, didn't she? <laughs> Leanne wrote that. She always proofs and edits my stuff. I, I, she, I will give her a, a, a co-authorship of that. I, I put a kind of a rough draft together, and then she comes in and says, what about this word? You didn't do this right. So she restructures it a little bit. I give her, I give her a byline on that. I don't think that's the truth. <laughs> I think you, think you said to your to wife, <laughs> hey, you know how I feel about casinos and smoking? Can you put some words down on that? And later on, there's 2,500 words. No, your wife's great. My wife does the same thing. I don't dare send anything out until she proofreads exactly. it. I think we both married English teachers in the dark. <laughs> All right, Ed, uh, last time we were here, uh, uh, we didn't have Obama for a second term yet. I think that Obamacare mm. was also at that time being questioned. Oh, wait, the last time you were here, we hadn't gone before the Supreme Court yet. We had not gone before the Supreme Court. So a lot of water under the bridge. Uh, all right, just talk to me like I'm a six-year-old. Tell me what's going on. I mean, I've heard the political <clears throat> pundits. I want to hear it from the expert. Well, Obamacare is the law of the land, and uh, while the initial... Uh, first couple of years did not have a lot of implication to change. We are now going to start getting in the throes of things, and we're going to see taxes uh, rise. We're going to see access of care to change in terms of how the delivery systems work. We're going to see employers left with the question of whether to drop their health care insurance and pay the penalties for that and allow their employees to get <clears throat> individual coverages, individual policies on their own in what's called health insurance exchanges, whether they work or not is still up in the air. I think we're going to see the shifting of cost of health care come more out of the consumer's pocket, even though there's a lack of belief that that's what the, that's certainly not what the intent of the law was, but I think that's what you're going to see happen here. So there's a lot of things that are going to cascade down the hall here, and people are going to say, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. So do you think it was intent or ignorance <clears throat> of this happening this way? I, didn't, I don't think they looked at the natural capitalistic instincts that were going to occur in the market 
such as rapid consolidation. And as rapid consolidation occurs, you only have so many provider networks to work within, and it takes away the incentive of competition. Mm. Then you begin to ask the question, well, why would I turn around and get involved in a race to the bottom of the sea. I go so many fathoms down and I begin to lose money and I may fail. So you're saying these are big government status that just didn't understand the free market system and human nature. I don't think they understood what the reaction among healthcare providers was going to be. Okay. Many of them are rushing and merging into what I would call these large oligopic health systems. And um, change occurs very slowly inside those types of organizations. Now, I was uh, in Nashville over the weekend, and I had a great conversation with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Berry, and he's with the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, um, well, I probably shouldn't have said his name. I don't. I didn't mean to do that. It's okay. I ran he's, into a he's, doctor who's he's very well, a well known, known and physician. has a prestigious. <laughs> anyway, he said you don't have to call them death panels if you don't want to, because the liberals don't want to hear that, and maybe nobody does. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly the way it's going to work down the line. They're going to evaluate the dollars they're going to have to invest to give you a new hip or a new heart or a new wing, whatever it is. And if you're too old and you're not in very good shape, you won't be the first in line to get that heart. Or they may turn around and say, <clears throat> we're only going to pay this much, and if you still want that, you need to pay the balance. Ah. And I, I think there yeah. is, uh, uh, I mean, that's what goes on actually today uh, uh, over in Europe in terms of trying to decide whether somebody is eligible for a certain... Uh, course of treatment or not and and there are actually formulas for all of this out there and uh, <clears throat> I know people say we're not going to have a rationing of health care <clears throat> I think we'll see dollars invested to help improve preventative health care but in terms of the treatment of health care it's going to be more challenging to get access all right now you just said a magic word preventative health care <laughs> um um and if you think I'm nuts on this, that's okay. You're you're an expert. And you can tell me I'm nuts. But now, now I, wait a minute here. Let's. I don't want. Let's not get too personal. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but on me, and I can only speak for me. Acupuncture has been very successful. Mm -hmm. It has prevented me from having surgery on a place that I had surgery before on my back, four and five. Yeah. Do you think that is the kind of preventative? Health care that may be covered in the future? No. Chiropractic? It's not covered today and it won't be covered tomorrow. Okay. Not necessarily that it doesn't work and the efficacy of it is certainly not disputed by many physicians out there, but they're not going to pay for things tomorrow that they're not paying for today. Okay. The struggle. Oh, that's, that's a good point. We're not, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. I, okay. Yeah, that makes absolutely. sense. All yeah. right. All right. Uh, Ed Brown is with us. He is the CEO of the Iowa Clinic, a very excellent clinic here in Des Moines. You're all over the place. Oh, we're all throughout Iowa, yeah. Yeah, you're all throughout the state. You said they're just uh, negotiating to open up a much larger facility in Ankeny, their latest uh, oh, really? uh, expansion. Do you have one in Norwalk so you can take care of the old money counters when they get gray and, and <laughs> limpety? <laughs> we'll, you can we'll put have, it right next to the new casino that's we'll going to be in Tom's nearby. backyard. We'll have one nearby, but maybe not in Norwalk. Norwalk. Okay. Um, we're talking about uh, health care. Um, I have seen... Uh, and I backed off a little bit from my political radar because I've been doing more faith-based shows. But um, it seems that every once in a while it pops up where somebody's now only getting so many hours at work and it's just a dog hair below full time. So they don't have to provide them with benefits. I've also heard employers like Walmart and some of those places have basically gotten rid of most of their quote unquote full time employees so they don't have to give benefits. Right. This Is this because of Obamacare? No, it's not because of Obamacare. It's in terms of those uh, individual uh, employer groups. They will pay a penalty fee on the portion of hours that they do work. And people that are in that category will have access to individual policies on these exchange concepts that are out there. And the Walmart will have to put forward at least a small dollar 
uh, percentage into a pool for them, and they'll have to pay the difference. And that is, was intended to increase competition among insurance companies in setting the price on these exchanges. There'll be multiple listings of insurance carriers from other parts of the country, even. Wow. Well, I had heard, Ed, that if you were a business with more than 40 employees. <clears throat> more than 50. More than, uh, more than 50. And even if you had, say, three or four different businesses, they are going to lump all those employees That's together true. That's and, true. And, and count that towards you. Um, doesn't the 35 hours have a, have a part in there? And isn't some of it have to do with Obamacare? If, if, if you've got, and these are FTEs. So if you've got half of them that are working 35 hours or less, then they don't count to the FTEs. Isn't that right? The full-time employees? I, I don't know that Haven't that's actually into that? the case. Okay. I'll have to look that's into that. That's what I've heard. I, and, you know, I'm no expert, but, <clears throat> but I thought this was part of the reason that what Mac was asking you. Because you could that, take and lump those together and say, yes, how yes, much but, is but, that But work? how many of those 50 now, we're working 40 now, they're working 35 hours, and they don't get counted well, as you, an FTE? No, my point being is all those below the 35, lump them together, and what would they equivalent Are, Is FTEs? that the way they're going to count it? I, I don't think they're going to get exempted completely by being the under 35. Okay. I mean, obviously this is kind of some of the details and minutia of this. Uh, well, and, and frankly, the rules are changing as we go guys. And, and if somebody finds and an daily, easy out, they'll be shut daily. down next oh, year, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, literally an average of three to four regulations coming out that are at our doorstep a day. Oh my Lord. Yeah, it's you gotta it's, be kidding no, me. No, no, it's you know. So what is this bait and switch? Is this here's Obamacare, but now that it's passed and it's passed, now they're changing things the way they really wanted it, which well, never would have been able to be voted on by the Senate. No, no, I would say what it was, and this commonly happens in legislation. Uh, we all remember the famous quote by uh, Nancy, Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi says, "You know, we need to get this passed before everybody has a chance to read it." Two-thirds of that bill uh, included writing, and the secretary shall, and the secretary shall do this, and the secretary shall do that. Those were all regulations, and all those regulations had yet to be developed and yet to be created to fit within the premise of the bill. And that's uh, usually not to that magnitude do regulations have to be written. But that is not an uncommon course in the development of a congressional bill. Who, 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 who's going to benefit? Make, make me feel better. Who's going to benefit from this? You know, I'm, I'm going to reserve comment on that until we've lived it a little while. I do believe what's going to happen is that over the course of five years, we're going to see the market resettle, re. Uh, recalibrate itself and it will reach a point of equilibrium and when we talk about well who's going to benefit who's going to get their ox gourd who's going to is this going to prove improve i do believe we'll see a shift to more individual policies i i do believe we will see an expansion of medicaid services out there in terms of medicaid coverages but the question of who's going to benefit long term, it's going to take time to see that. Well, Ed, one of the things we talked about at lunch was this ongoing message coming from Obama and other big government statists of a class warfare. Uh, one of the ones that often gets directed, and Brahma himself has said different things, you know, about the doctors. He made a comment some years ago about, well, you know, doctors motivated by money, you know, if it's more expensive to, you know, if it's better in their interest to give you a more expensive diagnostic, they'll do that. And uh, is part of this a class warfare thing that most people look at doctors as the upper one or two percent of income earners in this country and they want to punish them? Would that be part of this motivation? Obviously, the, the federal bureaucracy grows. And any time that, you know, bureaucrats and, and statists are in charge, they want to grow the federal bureaucracy. But is part of this message. OK, part of this message, one that is one of class warfare, I guess, is my question to you. Hold that question. Hold your answer. When we come back from the break, we'll answer that. My guest, Ed Brown, CEO of the Iowa Clinic. We're talking about health care. We'll talk about politics a little later, and then we'll talk about how 
Tom's article in the paper today was just exceptional. Well written by his wife, Leanne. Coming up next on webcast1live.com. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider, it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> Just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do, I mean, fixed rider, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. We've got questions. You've got the answer. Join the conversation. It's your voice we want to hear. So call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. 21 minutes after the hour live on webcast1live.com. It is Ed Brown, CEO of the Iowa Clinic, Dr. Tom Coates, and we're talking about health care, and we're going to get to the question the you asked in just a minute. But first, let's go to the phones. Frank, you're live on The View from a Pew. How are you doing today, Frank? Thank you, uh, uh, Mac. Um, yeah, Mac, Mac over here. N nice to meet you, Frank. How are you? <laughs> there's nothing that riles me up any more than when somebody lies straight to my face. Uh, this whole thing was sold under the Commerce Clause as a penalty and a fee. Then they turned right around and they went out to a courtroom in Virginia and argued this under the 16th Amendment on the government's ability to raise taxes, raise revenue. Obama said straight face to the American public, taxes will not go up on anyone making under 250 k in this country. Now, anybody who has saw a tax or, a, or, or a, a raise in their insurance rates has been lied to, and why the media does not call this out on this man. Mr. Brown? <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Frank, you're right on. Um, you can turn around and call it a penalty. You can turn around and call it a tax. I, I think we could uh, talk all afternoon about why this bill hasn't been aired out by the media and why it didn't go through due process when it was being evaluated in Congress. 
why was there such a rush that this thing had to occur? And Ed, uh, you said Time Magazine, this latest issue, is, uh, is some, if somebody's really <clears throat> interested in this, they should go and read the March 4th issue of Time Magazine. Yeah, it's called A Bitter Pill. And for the first time in Time Magazine's history, they dedicated an entire publication to one subject, and that is to the health care crisis and the health care issue. I have never been a huge uh proponent of Time magazine. Right. They usually have a, a pretty very, liberal. Yeah, pretty liberal slant. But there was one author of this entire magazine. He spent two years researching it. And he does have a very balanced, uh, very reasonable approach. It doesn't cover everything in the extensive detail that uh, you might like, but it does give you a perspective on it that covers things all the way from the delivery of care uh, through medical liability, through uh, insurance reform, and it just goes up and down the continuum to help you understand the complexity of uh, this form of commerce called healthcare. Well, uh, let's go back real quick to my question in regards to the uh, class warfare and class envy that this administration has engaged in from really day one. And they've been in a campaign mode from day one, going back in their first term. Uh, how can uh, this not be construed at some point as another chapter in the war on the on the wealthy and successful in this country? How can it stop short of where, you know, the socialized medicine over in Europe has gone, which is actually to limit the earnings ability of the doctors and the dentists and so forth? Well, the bill doesn't get into that at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the question is, is where is it going? I think we have uh, multiple... Um, economic forces going on here. We do not have enough money in the system to support the number of beneficiaries we have. So we either have to ration care, we have to either or, or limit access or a combination of both. And in so doing, you know, we talked about death panel to panels, maybe we limit access to certain procedures. That is hopefully going to make up the difference in the amount needed to cover that Medicare beneficiary population. But getting back to your question, mm -hmm. you know, is <clears throat> what if a physician's making five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars? There is a growing sense of envy among those who are disadvantaged, of those who have turned around and gotten their education and done the work in order to put themselves through to be able to provide a level of service that took a great deal of investment that you're making more than I think you deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that envy is resulting in, I think, a increase in taxes. We're going to turn around and penalize you for being successful. I could see at some point a certain level of caps on what the maximum amount someone makes and the potential of an excise tax on any dollars that are accumulated above that. There have already been rumblings to that effect uh, around healthcare circles. That would be a step, and the, and it would, and if we talked <clears throat> off the air, it would be a very high cap and it would be a very low excise tax. Once imposed, though, this, the amount of the excise tax increases to almost where it's eventually fully confiscatory and the side whoa, and the whoa, level whoa. big word fully what ta ta confiscatory take taking it away almost entirely from the person okay. over a certain level and the amount of the cap goes down uh, you know there, there's any number of things we're talking about you know the gambling <clears throat> issue step by step by step you get the nose of the camel into the tent and and as as obamacare thundered in and these kind of things will be happening ed you said you get two to three new regulations every day on your doorstep uh, I, I can see this one coming in within the next few years anyway. Yeah. I think they're going to be surprised at the reaction of these physicians that if you're going to cap me, my work effort's going to change. Sure. And that's going to increase the access issue and make it much worse. But isn't this a, a free market <clears throat> human nature thing that generally the statists ignore anyway? Uh, I won't dispute that, but what I what I think will actually uh, develop is a counter alternative type healthcare system, much like what has happened in England. You you have, and most people aren't aware of this. You have a complete for profit healthcare system that runs parallel to the national system in England. 
with virtually every city having a for-profit hospital and sometimes physicians who have private clinics outside the public clinic that they turn around and, and practice in. Interesting. Yeah. So. Why, why, Ed Brown is my <clears throat> guest, the CEO of the Iowa Clinic, along with Dr. Tom Coates. Um, why would I want to be? I'm, I'm 17. I'm 16. I'm a science freak. I love math. I'm a good student. I got the money to go to a good a medical school. Why would I want to? I mean, it just seems like it, you're, you're going to work for the man. Well, I don't believe that. I still believe it's a noble profession. I find physicians to be extraordinarily brilliant and extraordinarily adaptive to change, and they can figure ways around issues uh, quicker and faster than uh, the average bear. So um, <clears throat> I don't think you're going to see them settle for the status quo if it gets to be unreasonable. They'll, they'll come up just like the folks in England did. They'll come up with an alternative program. And they'll complain about it, and they'll protest, and they'll argue, and you think the government will bend? <clears throat> no. They'll come up with an alternative delivery system. Oh. I do, I do believe, um, and just like in Canada, uh, people may be shocked about this, but physicians do go on walkouts. They just don't. We're not working today. Right. And um, Yeah, I'm not on call today. Yeah. I'm unavailable. And, you know, they can create quite a havoc if, if they want to. That is not in their nature. Uh, they don't even, when it comes to even lobbying uh, Congress or going up to the state house. that's not something they feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That's out of their comfort zone. They say, well, this makes sense. They should just fix it. Mm -hmm. And they just presume logic will prevail. And that just doesn't run the course. You know, I think one thing that some some people don't understand, and I don't expect a liberal to understand this, but the rest of us <clears throat> good thinking people can understand it. Many entrepreneurial um, uh, uh, projects are funded by doctors because doctors do make good money and they're darn well worth every penny of it for what they've done to get there. But there's a lot of restaurants, there's a lot of retail, there's a lot of people like that who have investments from doctors, and if you start taxing doctors like that, that's going to hit the entrepreneurs right where they live. Well, now now you're talking like a businessman, a person who understands free market economics and the marketplace. See, I'm not a liberal. Yeah, that's right. You're, that's the <laughs> antithesis of the, of the liberal. All right. They, I, I can tell you they are great investors. Yeah. Um, they, they've gotten smarter at it because they've had their predecessors tell them the times when they weren't. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and they, too, are trying to figure out how do we cope in these changing times to get a reasonable return out there with a dollar earned. And uh, you're right. They do invest in those types of things, Mac. All right. A couple more questions on health care before we uh, move on to some politics. Um, there was a story on ABC National uh, this week where a new uh, drug app – and I forget what it's called now. I'm sorry, I can't think of freedrugs.org or something like that, where you could go in and say, okay, here's my zip code, and I want 45 milligrams of Lipitor. And it would pop up all the pharmacies that sold <clears throat> Lipitor and the price that they were charging for it. And in this mm -hmm. one instance, I think the girl was in Connecticut, it went from $14 and some odd cents to $149 and some odd cents for the same prescription for Lipitor, 45 milligrams. Why is there such a difference in the price of drugs all a lot of times within walking distance of your house? Usually it has to do with wholesale leverage. The small mom and pop store doesn't stand a chance against the large outlets that buy in much larger bulk, and they turn around and leverage that in terms of, you know, where are we going to put that on our pecking order of distribution? And you get an order for Lipitor, and you have this, you have two or three generics, and then you have Lipitor, and you know we decide we're going to support this generic right here, and that turns around and has quite an impact on, on the pricing. Um, you know, candidly, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, if you're talking about brand name drugs, they hike up the price of that to get their return mm -hmm. on research in a very big way. And most people don't understand that probably 90 percent of all the medical research, not just pharmaceutical, but also device occurs in the United States of America. And we're giving that away without any charge to the rest of the world. 
And um, so in, in another odd way, we've turned around and fud- funded mm. the progress and advancement of medicine here in the United States. And across the world. And across the world, yeah. Uh, Ed Brown's my guest, uh, CEO with the Iowa Clinic. What do you think is going to be uh, – well, uh, here's an example. My father, 88 years old, in wonderful health, fell a little ill the other day and had to go to the hospital for three or four days. And when he was taking his medicines, and this was a medicine-free guy, not even an aspirin, he would tell me, well, this is the forty-eight pill. And then at 9 o'clock, I take the $14 pill. And then it <laughs> – and – he did the shopping on the prescriptions and was amazed at how many differences there was. When will the average American begin to quote unquote shop their medical advice and treatment? I think that's actually coming pretty soon. I think these little tools right here, I'm holding up an iPhone yeah. are going to change medicine and you will see increase uh, competition as more and more the healthcare dollar gets put into the hands of the beneficiary and they have responsibility for it. And I do believe that's going to occur. Um, as that occurs, you will see different delivery mechanisms on this kind of device. And when you talk about the pharmaceutical mm-hmm. uh, element of this, um, that competition uh I think will drive the price down. But I also believe, and I was explaining this to Tom earlier, in healthcare, what happens is an element of shadow pricing. They find its watermark. And when it hits that watermark, and what I mean is the price may drop and then it flattens out and they all shadow each other not to go any lower than that. Ed Brown's my guest, CEO of Iowa Clinic, Tom Coates. When we come back, a little politicking. We got a seat coming open because Mr. Harkin's going bye-bye. Who's up for it? Who does he think will be the leader of the pack? It's next, live on webcast1live.com. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. The point is we are free now to do what we could never do before, and that is love and obey Christ and answer to him our savior rather than answer to someone else on this earth who sets him up as your authority you and i answer to christ and because of jesus christ the gospel was preached and you and i are blessed today because of abraham did you know that we're blessed experience truth 99.3 fm If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. Drink, dance, party. Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with Birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about Birthday Fridays at KittiesUSA.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. 
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. the ones in the pew, not pulpit. Come on now, let's reason together. The phone lines are open, so call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. 338-22 before the top and Salem Radio Network News, and then Michael Mudloff with True Blue. Speaking of uh, breaking news, Arkansas Senate has just passed a ban on abortion after 12 weeks. Just broke news. So uh, Arkansas, the first state, I believe, in the union to have such a ban on abortion after 12 weeks. And, of course, the Huffington Post calling it unfair, and we don't have any responsibility. Uh, we don't have any business over women's bodies, which I think is so funny because, uh, women, if you really think you have control of your bodies, I want you to take off all your clothes, and I want you to come down here and walk the skywalk with me. And, and we'll see if you have control over your own bodies and what you do with it. And if you really want to have control, this is going to make somebody mad. These are not the opinions of Tom Coates or Ed Brown, uh, Father Tattoo, or anyone here at webcast1life.com. And if you really want to have control over your body and you want to make the right choices, keep your legs together if you don't want to have a baby. Okay? Have what we call protected sex. Be smart about the gifts and the things that God has given you. And don't just lay down for any piece of white trash that comes along and then yell eight weeks later, I'm pregnant and I need an abortion. Okay, enough of me. We'll move on to your favorite passion, Tom, and that's smoking in casinos. <laughs> okay. Um, great article written by your wife uh, in today's, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, written by you uh, in today's paper, the Des Moines Register, page 9A, keeping smokers in casino is part of the plan. Uh, now, I know what you mean here because you and I have been friends for a long time, but tell, tell the listeners, because I don't think people understand the psychological needs mm -hmm. of smoking and gambling being kept together. Well, and that's what I was trying to portray. Uh, I start off, Mac, by uh, the, Kyle Munson is one that penned this column a couple weeks ago, and he wrote this article, and he was really incredulous over why the casinos would fight us hard about imposing a smoking ban in their casinos as, uh, as everyone else has to live under. He used an analogy of bars and restaurants and yeah. said many of those have actually increased their business uh, since this was imposed on them back in 08. Uh, they fought it, but the casinos, if they were smart, would gain a competitive advantage and go smoke-free. Uh, this is a denial and a misunderstanding of what makes the casinos tick, and that's why I wrote the article. Um, now, do you think that I articulated the position well yeah. enough for the average reader to understand what I was getting at? Well, I hope so. You know, I hope so. I mean, l l let's face it. Newspaper readership has really shifted left. And the problem with this is, and I, somebody's going to laugh because they think I'm making a joke, but uh -huh. I'm not. This has common sense. <laughs> okay. And most liberals don't want to apply. And I'm not trying to make a joke here. They don't apply common sense. Because okay. common sense means you have to put your feelings aside and think about what the truth is. And liberals don't like the truth. They just like to do what feels good. All right. Well, since I wrote it. But I think it, you did a good job. Since I wrote it a few days ago, and it only appeared in the paper today, but I introduced it to some other people. And different people came up and have come up today in emails to saying that I never got this, I didn't understand this, and I, it, once you lay it out, it becomes very clear, and I hope that's what I was able to do. Because to draw it down in kind of a nutshell, without rehashing the whole article, it says that especially a convenience casino, which is what I'm concerned with, those are the ones that are in Iowa. They're not the tourist model that are right. in Vegas. They're the ones that prey 70% of their of their. People, what you call that, a feeder market? Yeah, the 35-mile feeder market, 70% come from within that 35-mile feeder market. And 80% of it's drawn in to the slot machines, the video slot machines that decades ago were the, were the stepchild. They were the ones where 20 30% of a casino's revenue was being derived. They, they put the widows and the, and the spouses, they, the wives, they were to go over and play the nickel slots while, right. while daddy goes over and gambles the big money on the tables. Yeah. Uh, it flip-flopped. 
Now 80% comes from video slot machines. Only a small part comes from the dice and the card tables. And, and they're oftentimes relegated into non-smoking areas like at Prairie Meadows. Right, yeah, they you can't care. smoke in the poker room they at Prairie Meadows. They don't care if you smoke there or not because they're not making much money on it. What they are making on is the slot machines. And those people, in many cases, are addicts. Their problem, they're pathological gamblers. And when you get that personality, now it's a small percentage of their turnstile traffic, but it counts for close to half of their revenues in a convenience casino. Those people cross-addict in some very high percentages. Uh, they may have drug problems. They, they may have alcoholism problems. Many, many, many of them also are addicts to the nicotine, the cigarettes. Not the cigars, Ed. We're talking about <laughs> cigarettes here. Now, the cigarette smokers have to be allowed to stay in that environment uninterrupted. They want a drink. You bring them a drink. Uh, they need to go to the bathroom. You got to get, you know, some of them actually wear a depends so they can do it right there on the stool and never have to get up. That's right. But, uh, in the case of the cigarettes, you've got to allow them to continue to smoke within that environment. So they do not have to leave. If they have to leave that environment periodically to take their nicotine break, that breaks the spell that the casino has worked so hard to engage. No windows, uh, no clocks. Um, there, including uh, bringing a credit card machine to your to your stool, so you don't have to get up. Um, dingy, dingy, dingy. Yeah, all those <laughs> things are done. Even the in, even the scents are 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 brought in oftentimes to relieve you of inhibitions. You cannot afford to allow that spell to get broken. If you do periodically right. break it to go out and satisfy your nicotine, you will not stay there as long. You might not come as often, but you will definitely not stay as long, and their revenues will decline dramatically. And therefore, the casino's concerns are valid, but the reason that they're valid, and it is such a predatory environment, it isn't like a bar, it isn't like a restaurant, it isn't like any other business out there. It is more like if we set up an opium den. If we, if we legalized uh, all sorts of hard drugs tomorrow and we set up places where they can go and enjoy the hard drugs, that is much more analogous than it is any other legitimate commercial business out there where the public is being catered to. It's the commercialism of Pavlov's theory. There you go. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it, you put all this stuff together and one sense um, stimulates the other. Mm -hmm. And if you can be po puffing on a cigarette... And hearing the ding, 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 and putting money into a slot machine, and then visually the bright colors and the movement, it just kind of hypnotizes you into what you're doing. Very much yeah. so. There was a movie a few years ago. Great that, pleasure from it. That my kids watched uh, something, something, The Lightning Thief. And I don't suppose you guys saw it, but it showed these young people going into a casino. They were hunting for something, and they ate a flower. And this flower put them into a trance. And some of those people were staying there for years and decades in this casino. And it was kind of a, uh, a parody of what the casinos really do. They, they set up a, uh, an addictive environment that you never want to leave from. Well, and, you know, it, uh, I think most people know this. Maybe they don't. Uh, restaurants. I know when we built restaurants, we were very careful with the colors that we used on the walls and on the seats. There were certain restaurants that you would use certain colors with. Uh, I, I was a burger and, and chicken place. You know, that's basically what I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to use the colors that the fine dining places use mm -hmm. because I, they would think I'm too expensive for the hamburger they're eating. Likewise, the fine dining places don't want to use the hamburger stuff because you'll you, it'll think cheap. You'll think, oh, well, this is a cheap place. It's not worth 21 bucks for a 16-ounce T-bone steak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not just casinos that do this. Let's not just point at casinos. No, but, but, but casinos are the only ones left that combine alcohol, the visuals, and the smoking. Well, you, again, you understand that when somebody comes in to eat a meal, normally you're not preying primarily on people that are addicted to food. Now, everybody right. needs to eat. But they're not addicted to food. Now, you could argue it's a little closer to the bar business because a, a, a certain percentage of your bar traffic is dependent on, on the alcoholics. But even that model pales in comparison to the reliance on the addict of the casino. It is institutionalized addiction. Institutionalized addiction. That's an interesting term. I haven't heard that. Before. That's, That's a, a Tom Coates term, like if I've ever heard. Institutionalized need, addiction. And the video slot machines <clears throat> are the biggest driver. They were we referred years ago as the crack cocaine of addicted gambling. Normally, a person that starts to gamble, Mac, may take three to four years on the average to transition from the occasional gambler to a hardcore pathological gambler, the, the worst kind, the ones that steal and commit suicide in high numbers. Um, 
the video slot machines are so intentionally addictive, and especially with this generation growing up playing all sorts of video mm -hmm. games, you can almost go overnight from being a casual gambler to a hardcore pathological. Tom Coach is our uh -huh. guest. Ed Brown is our guest. When we come back, a little bit of politics. What's happening? Mr. Harkin is going bye-bye, and there's a whole bunch of people lined up for that seat. We'll talk about that when we come back next, live here on The View from a Pew on webcastonelive.com. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for Him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. got questions you've got the answer join the conversation it's your voice we want to hear so call 855-244-0077 now here's j michael mccoy 10 before the top salem radio network news i'm j michael mccoy if i haven't told you lately thanks for listening I know there are so many choices you have from three to four especially you being the sophisticated one that's discovered the internet you no longer just rely on the AM and the FM band within a 40 to 50 mile radius of your home. You now have discovered the literally, I suppose there are millions, but I'm safe to say hundreds and hundreds of thousands of audio based programs that you can listen to off of the internet. If you're not listening to us live and you're lifting, listening to us on a podcast, an extra thank you. That means you like what we do. Uh, so much that you've got us on your RSS feed and you're downloading our podcasts. And it amazes me. Uh, and Ed, I don't know if I've ever told you this, 80% of our listenership comes on podcasts. I'll be gone. Now, as an old radio guy, that just breaks my heart. <laughs> because in the old days, Tom, when you and I started, yeah. you said it, it was gone. There was no way to go back and listen to it again. It was done. Now, four out of five of the people that listen to this program will listen when it's not live and listen later on. And they'll listen to it within 60 days. I'll be gone. It's just incredible. That's All right. Remarkable. Let's talk about, uh, and I should have brought the copy of the paper in today, because they had a really good, was your article in today? It was yeah, in today. Yeah. Is this the, yeah, this is today. Is this the same, is this the same one that had all the Republican? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Go, go to the front. Okay. Like page three or four. All right, good. You, do you have the whole section? There you go. No, no. that's not it. That's, uh, that would be right in, yep, there, there it there is. All right. There you go. Um, so let's talk about, and if you notice, the last time the Des Moines Register printed an article about this, 10 days ago, there was like, what, five or six people on the list? Well, and we had our last week's guest on there immediately showcased. He was one of them, Doug, Doug Gross, Gross, which yep. I think they messed up by not putting him in there again. I, think, I mean, if they're going to put guys like Steve Dace and Bob <laughs> Vanderplatz in, they're definitely ought to have Doug Gross. Why do you think they didn't put Gross? I don't know. I think it may have been an oversight. They were they put him in there before. The I think he's a legitimate oversight? candidate. Oversight? 
the register oversight. Well, now they, hold it now, Mac. They printed my article today in its entirety, and that's the first time that's happened in a long time. Your, so, really, they didn't edit it. So All right. well, let's let's not give them too much grief today. All right. Um, the, of course, Tom Harkin stepping down. First time in how many years? Thirty six. That that seat's go, up you know, for grabs. It's well over thirty. I don't. Yeah. Know. Um, the top three. Candidates, uh, well, I guess I should have said the top four candidates were Latham, King, Northey, and Reynolds. Mm -hmm. And Latham has already said he's not running. He's out. And our guest last week, Doug Gross, predicted that Steve King will look at the polling numbers and pull himself out as right. well. And, and also he said, uh, I liked what Doug said. It made a lot of common sense. He said, you know, Steve's got a comfortable place. He's got good constituents. He's not known by everyone across the state, but he's really well known. He handily defeated Vilsack. Not that she wasn't just a bad uh, campaigner, but, you know, they threw, she was. they threw millions of dollars they at did. that campaign. Uh, they if they'd have had a better uh, candidate, they might have given him a run for his money. I mean, he is a, an annoyance to the Democratic Party. He is yeah. a talking head that is often quoted that just sort of gets them yeah. viscerally worked up. I he, see him on some of the cable stations being interviewed from time to he time. He was on Sean Hannity last night. Yeah. L yeah. Uh, yeah. So he, he gets on there. All right. So, and Ed, you're a, you're, you know your politics. You're, you're involved and in, uh, you're an expert in three things. Uh, one is uh, medicine, two is politics, and the third one will keep quiet. <laughs> Um, I don't know what there is nothing there. I'm just do I'm just being funny. Cigars. Um, yeah. cigars. <laughs> All right. Now he, I'll be honest with you, this is a guy I've never heard of. Mark Chelgren. Mm -hmm. He's a state senator from Wapolo County. Now he would be at risk of losing his twenty fourteen district that though redistricting has grown far more democratic than we first won in twenty ten. Chalgren is a social conservative with a liberal streak. Years back, he earned popularity on Ragbri as Chicken Man. Oh, that's what I want to be known as. Um, second is a Drew Ivers. Uh, too early to make a decision. I'm not taking any specific action, he says to the GOP. He's a Vietnam veteran, Republican Party for 35 years. He has chaired five statewide presidential campaigns. Pat Robertson, Pat Buchanan, Ron Paul. Uh, you either know anything about Mr. Ivers? Mm. No, no I, I honestly don't. Okay. Uh, Rod Roberts. I now, there's Rod, a guy that gained you know, some respect in the last yeah, gubernatorial we primary. Very, very well regarded. Rod's a good man. He's on the Iowa Prayer Breakfast team with me. Yep. Iowa House 2001 to 2011 lost his bid for governor in 2010. He's currently the director of the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals. Hmm? Uh, nothing in the Iowa Code chapter on government ethics would require a departure, would require his departure. Uh, his to leave. Okay, so he could hold. He could keep his foot on the bag while he ran for yep. uh, ran for the Senate. Yes. All right, Matt Schultz, uh, Iowa's election chief. Uh, he hasn't announced his plans regarding uh, re-election in 2014, and isn't making much noise about a Senate bid. But he is quietly getting his thoughts together in the case. He does say, if King doesn't run, I haven't made a decision yet, but I'm considering all my options. Anybody know anything about Matt Schultz? Well, yeah, I mean, Matt's been, his, his platform's been voter ID. It's been a great platform, but, you know, he's taken a bit of a beating in, in and the they're media. they're going to come after him this next time. Yeah, and they are going to come after him. So uh, that may be why he's taken uh, some consideration to think of doing something else, but I, I think he'd be a stretch. Kent Sorensen. Socially conservative state center from Warren County. Mike Huckabee is one of his friends. He's a Christian conservative. He also is a Ron Paul libertarian. Uh, do you want to comment? No, about? I okay. No. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, your that, mic isn't that on. That is not the issue at all on this one, Dan. That's not uh, Ron, Ron Paul doesn't really enter into this discussion. No, I. Um, I think there, uh, you know, there's there's mixed feelings uh, about uh, Sorensen out there. Uh, I think he would be hard pressed to uh, garner an overwhelming uh, uh, generation of support. Not to say that he wouldn't have some people out there, but I, I don't think it would be enough to muster a serious campaign. Matt Whitaker. I think. Uh I wouldn't dismiss that as quickly as some people might. Brad's on. 
the problem that you're asking me now, and I think Ed's got some feelings too on uh, Brad's on. We all like Brad. I think yep. he brings a lot. I mean, Doug said last week he brings a lot to the table. I do think that the mud slinging that, that took Boswell. him up two years ago with Boswell is still sticking to him a little bit. And whether he can even organize a statewide campaign quickly enough to even at all to do this i don't know I, i'd have i'd have a hard time believing it. 60 seconds left Va, bob vanderplatz uh the perennial campaigner and uh, too much about bob okay and last uh the uh, uh the hot ticket in the race steve dace <laughs> Uh, I'll go with Kim Reynolds, and I'll say uh, she uh, she is a new face. She's articulate. I think if you're going to take on Braley, you're going to have to have a fresh face that is going to be able to captivate the young vote and the women's vote if you're going to be a Republican. And right now, we're not doing too good in those categories. All right. We already know that Tom has a Steve Dace go, go, go sign in his front yard. <laughs> Steve, my man. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to wrap it up for today. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Michael Mudloff is next. Until I see you again, just do me one favor, would you? Please, tonight, when it's dark, pray. <laughs> <laughs>